Today we're speaking with Dr. Curtis Harris, Chief of the Laboratory of Human Carcinogenesis and Chief of Molecular Genetics and Carcinogenesis Section at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for joining us. You gave the distinguished lecture, Inflammation and Cancer, Interweaving MicroRNA, Innate Immune, and P53 Pathways. Would you describe how infection and chronic inflammation contribute to the etiology and pathogenesis of cancer? Yeah, the concept that there's a relationship between inflammation and cancer goes back more than a century, but there's hard data now to uh, show that perhaps uh, over two million people in the, in the world are uh, who have cancer associated with inflammation. Uh, the inflammation can be caused primarily to inherited uh, reasons, such as hemochromatosis, uh, but more frequently acquired infections with viruses, such as hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus, uh, bacteria that are associated with stomach cancer, or parasites such as liver flukes and, and cancer of the bile ducts. So there's an unrecognized until recently cause of inflammation, and that's obesity and uh, gastric reflux that uh, is associated with, with uh, Barrett's esophagus and Barrett's uh, uh, and, uh, esophageal cancer. Obesity is a chronic inflammatory disease, and it's associated with, with uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, and cancer. How does it, the expression of microRNAs and inflammatory genes serve as biomarkers of cancer risk, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic outcome? Are there implications in this work for early detection? Well, cancer researchers uh, are interested in what causes cancer, what, why one person has increased risk versus another, and those are people who will be targets for, for preventive uh, activities and for screening. Obviously, diagnosis of cancer is important. Prognosis is important because the surgeon may remove the tumor and you want to know whether or not it's all gone or there are metastases or there are micrometastases and does a, the patient need additional therapy? And then therapeutic aspects of this is, will some people respond to therapy better than others because they have uh, a genetic uh, predisposition for uh, uh, a, a response to, to the therapy? We're particularly interested in early stage cancer. Cancer in which the surgeon, such as lung or colon cancer, surgeon removes the cancer, the lymph nodes are negative, the uh, scans are negative, and we know, though, that about 40 to 50 percent of those people have micrometastases and are going to die of their cancers if we don't intervene. So microRNAs and inflammatory genes are biomarkers that we and others have used to ask the question, can we distinguish those early stage cancers that have micrometastases? versus those who don't. And uh, there's been a great deal of progress in this emerging field in the, in the last four or five years. Would you discuss P53's role in cellular senescence in normal and malignant human cells? How does P53 regulate specific microRNAs and TRF2 expressions? Yeah. Well, P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. It's also called the guardian of the genome. And in normal aging, cells become senescent. In other words, they stop their proliferation and they uh, are uh, in a dormant stage and they can't go on to proliferate. And P53 is important in that, that process. But in cancer, you bypass or the cells bypass that barrier uh, for senescence and uh, become immortal and have genomic instability. And they do that in several different ways. With the P53 uh, barrier, it may be a mutation in the P53 gene that inactivates it. Well, we recently discovered there are isoforms, forms of the P53 gene that uh, uh, have altered uh, activities that can inhibit the wild type or the normal P53. And there's a switch from one type of isoform to another that's important in in controlling senescence and bypassing senescence. But there are also other barriers for senescence that protect 
cells from becoming cancer cells, in, including the RB uh, tumor suppressor uh, pathway. Could you discuss the gene environment interaction in the molecular epidemiology of cancer, especially when it comes to lung and colon cancer? Yeah, this is a very big topic and one in which we've been interested in for more than uh, 30 years. Uh, the genes can be classified as high penetrance genes, those which outweigh the environment. And in colon cancer, about 5% of colon cancer is due to these high penetrance genes, which are involved with germline mutations in mismatch repair or germline mutations in the APC tumor suppressor gene. 95% of colon cancer is related to low penetrance genes, which modify the effects of the environment. And uh, in colon cancer, inflammation plays an important role. So people who have inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, have an increased risk of developing cancer. There's a great deal of interest now in diet and also in the microbiome. So that's the microflora, that's the, the uh, uh, microorganisms that inhabit the gastrointestinal tract. So there's a lot of very interesting data that's accumulating in this area in terms of how this might affect obesity, it might affect uh, cancer and other diseases. Lung cancer is a special case. There are no high penetrant genes that have been discovered. And so uh, the environment, in this case tobacco smoking, is the overriding uh, cause of, of uh, lung cancer. And it's so powerful, tobacco smoke has maybe 60 different chemical carcinogens in it. It's a witch's brew of, of carcinogens. And it also causes inflammation. So it's a combination of those things. So to find genes, in, including low penetrance genes, that influence the risk of, of lung cancer in heavy tobacco smokers um, has not been very successful. But if you look at people who smoke only a little bit or are exposed to secondhand smoke, some of these low penetrance genes come out. So you have this balance between these genes that are involved in DNA repair uh, versus a small amount of, of, uh, of tobacco smoke. And we've just recently published a paper in which we found that in childhood, exposure to passy smoke or secondhand smoke from the parents increases their risk, especially if they have a genetic hyperactive innate immune system. So the combination of those two increase the risk of cancer, even though they never smoke. These people never smoke. And uh, so this is an example of small amount of smoke, a susceptible individual, a child, and secondly, a child who has a genetic predisposition in, and leads to an uh, increase in risk of cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. You're welcome.